then you watch the moon landing, and then you reflect on the moon landing, and as time moved on, it never kept happening. I learned that almost all of our astronauts have been Freemasons. I learned that almost all of our astronauts have been Freemasons. Most of our founding fathers, 14 or 15 of our presidents, are Freemasons. Yeah, it was a little bit of a sham, I admit. Uh, you know, the reality is a lot of times you get up there and get in the cockpit and something goes wrong somewhere and you go back down. So actually, when you actually lift off, it's really a big surprise. <laughs> oh boy. Walter Cronkite captured the moment. Building shaking. What a moment. Man on the way to the moon. What did it feel like? It felt like a train on a bad railroad track and shaking in every direction. <laughs> and it was loud, really loud. Neil Armstrong is 75 now, an aging hero, but his winning smile is still there. We remember him as the cool and confident commander of Apollo 11, joined by his crewmates Buzz Aldrin and Michael Collins. On a windswept day, we went with Armstrong to an old Apollo launch pad at Kennedy Space Center to hear the story of one of man's greatest adventures. That July morning in 1969 when you came out and you gave that thumbs up, that was a very confident view you put on. Yeah, it was a little bit of a sham, I admit. Uh, the ghostly image was beyond words. Armstrong paused on the bottom rung of the ladder and planted his left boot on the lunar dust. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Do you recall how you came up with that? a small step for a man. What was the inspiration for it? Well, I thought, well, when I step off, I'm just going to be a little step. It's going to be a step from there down to there. But then I thought about all those 400,000 people that had given me the opportunity to make that step and thought, well, it's, it's, it's going to be a big something for all those folks and indeed a lot of others that even weren't even involved in the project so it was a, a, a kind of a simple correlation of thoughts. I was a nine-year-old kid in the 1960s had a big afro you know <laughs> and uh, visiting some relatives of a friend of mine in Virginia so I was in Virginia there was the small black and white TV and there were the first fuzzy images of Neil Armstrong taking his first steps on the moon the moon you know, the moon is up there, well, but where, do, how does, it, you know, you, you go through this sort of existential, uh, are they really up there? Because you can see the moon. It's not something hidden, you didn't need special apparatus to know that the moon is up there. It's there. And I remember thinking distinctly, oh, first moon landing. Be the beginning of a whole new era. And I'm sure I was not alone with those thoughts. But because I was certain as was everyone else, that it was the beginning of an era, I didn't, I, I didn't jump for joy or do somersaults. I just said, it's the beginning. So there we were anticipating the moon landing. Then you watch the moon landing, and then you reflect on the moon landing. And as time moved on, it never kept happening. Mr. Armstrong. I do realize that when you were on the moon, you had very little time for gazing upwards. But could you tell us something about what the sky actually looks like from the moon, the sun, the earth, the stars, if any, and so on? The sky is uh, a deep black uh, when viewed from the moon, as it is when viewed from uh, cislunar space, the space between the earth and the moon. The uh, the Earth is the only visible object other than the Sun that can be seen, although there have been some reports of seeing planets. I myself did not see planets from the surface, but I suspect they might uh, be visible. The Earth is quite beautiful from space uh, and from the Moon. It looks quite small and quite remote, but uh, it's very blue and covered with uh, white lace and <laughs> of the clouds. and. The continents are clearly 
seen, although they have very little color from that distance. What about the sun? Do you see any trace of the corona? No, the uh, glare from the sun on the helmet visor was too difficult to pick out the corona. The only time we could see the corona was during an eclipse of the sun from the moon, that is when we were flying through the moon's shadow and could observe the, the, uh, the solar corona peeking out from behind the moon. Looking at the photographs that you brought back, uh, the colored photographs of the moon's surface, it seems that the color of the surface actually varies according to the angle from which you see it. Is this so? Does it, uh, does it do this? Yes, it certainly does. Uh, it's a characteristic that we observe first while uh, traveling around the moon in orbit. You can see that at the terminator, at the, uh, the, the boundary between the black part of the moon and the lighted part of the moon, uh, it was as if you were looking at a television set with the contrast turned uh, to f uh, full contrast, very black and very white. Uh, as you moved uh, further into the light, there were more and more shades of gray. But as you moved further, such the sun was higher above the horizon, you actually start to see the uh, tans and browns appear, although uh, at a very low level. Similarly, on the surface of the moon. There we were anticipating the moon landing. Then you watch the moon landing. And then you reflect on the moon landing. And as time moved on, it never kept happening. It was just there, now receding in the past. And had I known that our first steps on the moon would essentially be our last steps on the moon, I would have, I would have on somersaults, <laughs> I would have said, oh my gosh, this is a unique moment in the history of our species, uh, never to happen again, let me revel and celebrate and pop champagne corks. Um, I would have felt differently had I known that that was the beginning of the end rather than the beginning of the beginning. When you were actually walking about on the moon's surface and kicking about a certain amount of dust, did you notice any local color? And also, were you at all subconsciously worried about the possibility of unsafe areas? Well, the color is a, is a puzzling phenomenon on the, on the moon, aside from the characteristics that I've already mentioned. Uh, you generally have the impression of being on a desert-like surface with rather light-colored hues. Uh, yet when you look at the material uh, at close range, as if in your hand, you find it's a charcoal gray, in fact, and we were never able to find any things that were very different from that color. Uh, I suspect that as we get more and more samples with future flights, we will see that there is, in fact, some color, but the optical properties on the moon are most peculiar. When you were actually walking about, did you have any difficulty in distance judging? Because I, th I think I heard you say once that uh, near afar things looked quite near. Yes, we had uh, uh, some difficulties in perception of, of, uh, of distance. Uh, for example, our television camera uh, we judged to be from the cockpit of the lunar module only about uh, 50 to uh, 60 feet away, yet we knew that we had pulled it out to the full extension of a 100-foot cable. Uh, similarly, we had difficulty uh, guessing how far the hills out on the horizon might be. Uh, the peculiar phenomenon is the closeness of the horizon due to the yeah. greater curvature of the moon than we have here on Earth, of course, four times greater, and the fact that uh, it is an irregular surface with uh, crater rims overlying other crater rims. Uh, you, you can't see the real horizon. You're seeing hills that are somewhat closer to you. Uh, there was a large crater, uh, which we overflew during our final approach, which was, it had hills of the order of 100 feet in height. And uh, we were only 11, 1,200 feet west of that hill, and we couldn't see a 100-foot high hill from 11 to 1,200 feet away. So Did you notice any obvious difference between the far side and the near side as you went around it? I mean, apart from the obvious difference in topography. N no observable distant, uh, differences in color, uh, but then uh, the sun's angle was always somewhat different yeah. over there, so it would be difficult to make a uh, general uh, correlation. Mm. Uh, 
I would say the topography is the striking yeah, change. Yeah. Of course, as uh, all your viewers mm -hmm. know, there are no seas on the far <laughs> side of the moon. The pictures that came back were quite remarkable. What did it look like to you, to your naked eye? It's, uh, it's a brilliant surface in that sunlight. The horizon seems quite close to you because the curvature is so much more pronounced than here on Earth. It's an interesting uh, place to be. I, it's, uh, I recommend it. <laughs> hey, that's something. Magnificent flight out here. Magnificent ventilation. Armstrong and Aldrin spent just a short time on the lunar surface, testing the gravity, completing a long list of experiments, and marking their journey. They had come in peace for all mankind, but stayed less than a day. God bless you. Good night from Apollo 11. One more thing I'd like to ask you. Uh, you're one of the very, very few people, I think, whose opinion on this is really worth having. In fact, there are only four of you. Do you think, from your knowledge of the moon, having been there, that it is going to be possible in the foreseeable future to set up scientific bases there on anything like a large scale? Oh, I'm quite certain that we'll have such bases uh, in our lifetime, uh, somewhat like the Antarctic stations uh, and similar scientific outposts, continually manned. Although, uh, certainly, there's the problem of the environment, the vacuum, and the high and low temperatures of day and night. Still in all, in many ways, it's more hospitable than Antarctica might be. Uh, there are no storms, no snow, no high winds, no unpredictable weather uh, phenomena that we're yet uh, aware of. And the gravity is a very pleasant kind of place to work in, better than here on Earth. And uh, I, I think it would be quite, quite a pleasant place to do scientific work and quite practical. Mr. Armstrong, thank you very much. And again, let me say what a tremendous honor and privilege it's been to have you with us. Thank you. I learned that almost all of our astronauts have been Freemasons. And I think the big regret, that when I reflect on that era and I look at how hopeful people were about our future in space, in retrospect, it's clear as day that there was a disconnect between why we were going into space and why people thought we were going into space. We were going, to a spa in, we were going into space because we were at war with the Soviet Union. War drives the flow of money like no other force of nature. And it cost a lot of money to go to the moon. So in that regard, it kind of helped that we were at war with the Soviet Union. It enabled Congress to write checks that they wouldn't otherwise have written. So what happens? We beat the Soviet Union to the moon. Checks stop getting written. <laughs> All right. Mars gets farther away. Mars recedes, which was the natural next step. If, it was, if exploration was just a natural thing that we did as Americans, we would have been on Mars by the early 1980s. And it became clear in retrospect that without the military driver, that was never going to happen. What I find remarkable about that time period is that we went to the moon, which was some of the most hopeful. What I like about that time period is that consider that in the 1960s, the civil rights movement was in full swing. So I and my family were basically disenfranchised. In, in many ways that others never even had the occasion to think about because they just go on in life. Okay. We were at war in Southeast Asia. The 1960s is probably the most turbulent decade in American history since the Civil War of the 1860s. And so in that decade we embark upon the greatest epic adventure the species has ever undertaken. And the juxtaposition of those two, in my mind and my heart, is a remarkable, it's a, rem it's a remarkable thing. The fact that in 1968, the first mission to leave low Earth orbit, that was Apollo 8, that's a forgotten mission. They didn't land on the moon, but they left Earth. No one had ever left Earth before. They left Earth and then turned the camera back towards Earth. 
And for the first time, there it was, Earth. No national boundaries drawn, no sense or awareness that there are warring nations down there, just this beautiful blue marble ball adrift in space. Why do we celebrate the Saturn V rocket, the mightiest rocket ever launched, the rocket that took humans to the moon? We celebrate it as much as we do because we haven't done anything better than it since. Had we done better things than it since, we would dust it off, put it in the corner of a museum and say, wasn't that cute? Look at how they got to the moon back then. Whatever is the metric of the advance of technology as a means of getting us into space, it hasn't happened since the Saturn V rocket, and that was 40 years ago. So that should be an embarrassment to us as a nation. And so, yeah, we should celebrate. No taken away from that achievement. But at some point, you should take pause and say, how come I'm not celebrating something else? It should have happened since then. I think that's where your emotions should be placed. Yeah, cut the cake and enjoy the champagne. <laughs> but at the end of the day, ask yourself, hmm, what does this mean? What does this mean for America? What does it mean for exploration? That we're here on this speck we call Earth. The day you stop that enterprise, I, I fear for the future of the species because it's that which distinguishes humans from all other animals. That we explore and understand what it is we're doing while we're at it and expand our place in the cosmos. If that stops, you know, I don't, I don't want to live in those times. Put me back at another time. Or put me in the future when people relearn what exploration is all about. Or dare I say, l allow me to, to, to look over the shoulder of in other countries, because other countries are doing that now. We're going to stand on our shore and say, hey, take us with you. <laughs> You're going to Mars. You know, that's not America. That's the America I grew up in. Not the America any of us wants. That's some other kind of America. God bless you. Good night from Apollo 11. The hard part was re-entry. They returned to Earth superstars. In New York, four million people showered them with ticker tape. On a 45-day victory lap around the world, they were met by crowds in the Congo and by the Queen at Buckingham Palace. But as Armstrong reveals in his new biography, published by our sister company, Simon & Schuster, he was unprepared for his sudden celebrity and found it to be both a blessing and a burden. Friends and colleagues all of a sudden uh, looked at us, uh, or treated us uh, slightly differently than they had months or years before when we were working together. I never quite understood that. <laughs> you said once to a reporter, how long must it take before I cease to be known as a spaceman. Why did you make that comment? I guess we all like to be recognized not for one uh, piece of fireworks, but for the ledger of our daily work. You sometimes seem uncomfortable with your celebrity, that you'd rather not have all of this attention. No, I just don't deserve it. <laughs> but look, how many people have walked on the moon? Twelve? Mm -hmm. You were the first. You were chosen to do that. That's special. Yeah, I wasn't chosen to be first. I was just chosen to command that flight. Circumstance put me in that particular role. That wasn't planned by anyone. I learned that almost all of our astronauts have been Freemasons.